Today's presentation is Max Bradle, medical illustrator, Leipzig to Baltimore, making early surgeons famous. The presenter is W. Randolph Chitwood, Jr., MD, FACS, FRCS, England, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor, Director of the East Carolina Heart Institute. Dr. Chitwood has been at ECU for about 28 years. I want to tell you about Max Bradle, and it's pronounced Bradle, mit the umlaut, over the O. Uh, he was a very interesting person, and I've been interested in medical illustration for many, many years. So here's the premise. I'm actually going to give you the final slide in the first slide. The premise is that Max Bradle was the father of American surgical illustration and that he developed innovative art techniques that I'll show you that most closely rep replicate anatomic accuracy, texture of tissues, contour, and lighting of surgical operations, which most accurately represents what we see at surgery and gives you the details to perform these operations. His personal work amplified significantly the early influence of Johns Hopkins surgeons on American surgery. Would these surgeons have been as famous Remember, Johns Hopkins was like ECU. It was a very nascent organization in 1895 and 96 and 97. The hospital opened in 98, 1898. And basically, it was a group of surgeons and uh, medical doctors who came to, to Hopkins to start it and uh, start the program. But would these surgeons have been as famous without Max Bradle? I don't think so. So he also founded the School of Art as Applied to Medicine at Johns Hopkins, which is still going, ongoing, and trains medical illustrators, albeit the techniques being somewhat different today. Sometimes not only pen and ink or carbon dust drawings, but also dealing with computers and, uh, and different types of computer animations that you can develop that will illustrate the operations that we do. His students, and you'll see this, expanded widely Bradle's influence on clinical practice, not only just at Hopkins, but on surgical education, which still pervades our books and, and textbooks uh, well into the 21st century. His work is still at Hopkins. I've been through it all. It remains a living library and a model for surgeons and illustrators who aspire to produce and publish the most accurate and detailed realistic surgical artwork. So this is Max's parents. Max was born in near Leipzig by Henrietta and uh, Paul Lewis Bradle in uh, June 8th, 1870. He died in 1941. At that time Leipzig was the font of intellectual Curiosity and education in Germany. There were two centers, Heidelberg and Leipzig. Of course, Leipzig later became in East Germany and things changed then. But it was really the fountain of cultural and scientific education uh, in Germany at that time. Here's a picture of Max. It's actually a self-portrait. Pretty good for a 16-year-old, wouldn't you say? Without any formal education, he did this. And as you can see, it's sort of is in chiaroscuro, which is basically in Italian for saying it's for light and shadow, with highlights and darks and all the middle tones, the things that we seek in photography today. Despite his urgings from his father to become a banker and his music, music teacher to become a musician, a pianist, he entered the Kuhnlecker Kunst Academy und Institut für Physiologie in Leipzig which is basically the Art Academy in Leipzig. <laughs> now, the reason this is preserved, and this is one of his early drawings when he was at the Kunst Academy, is because when he immigrated to the United States, he brought everything with him, all of his illustrations. Because during the war, World War II, the 
Kunst Academy was bombed and all this was lost. I've been to the Kunst Academy and to the University at Leipzig, Universität Leipzig, and basically uh, there's nothing left of all this stuff. But he was smart enough to bring all of his illustrations with him. But look at this work, 1885, as a young student at the Kunst Academy. Here we see a torso and a face, 1886, 1885. And here we see the work that he did. He finally moved into physiology. He's not a physiologist. He was asked by Carl, Lu Carl Ludwig. And almost all the American physiologists went and trained with Carl Lupsi Ludwig in Leipzig at the Institute of Physiology. And what do you see here? You see a comograph which is basically a way that we could register tracings of heart impulses, electrical impulses as well. This is before we had recorders of the types of recorders we have today. And also the isolated heart machine where he was able to perfuse isolated hearts and study the physiology of this. What has this got to do with illustration? Well, he was asked to work with Carl Ludwig and to draw all of the different layers of the brain and to magnify it up 150 times. So basically he came to work there with Carl Ludwig. Well, how did he get to America? Well, he works at the Kunst Academy doing this work with Carl Ludwig and then William Henry Welch, who founded, was the founding dean of Johns Hopkins, came to work in the physiology lab and met Bradle. And so he told Franklin Payne Mall and Howard Atwood Kelly and Thomas Cullen and these others at Hopkins. Kelly was the first professor of, of OBGYN at that time. Welch was the, uh, the inaugural dean. And here's William Henry Welch and a drawing that's actually by Max Bradle of Welch when he was young. Welch was also at the opening of Duke University Medical Center because his trainee was Wilbur Davidson who was the first, uh, uh, the first dean at Duke. And here's Franklin Payne Mall, who was the anatomist, who used his illustrations prolifically, and Howard Atwood Kelly, and we'll show you a little bit about this. And these were all young men who were founding Johns Hopkins. So basically, he sailed on the liner Dresden and arrived in Baltimore, seen at Johns Hopkins, January 18th, 1894. Speaking very little English, if any. Uh, and very much of a fish out of water coming to the United States. But basically he knew that his new era was with this new hospital. And he thought he could come and work with these illustrators and be paid and make a living as a medical illustrator. So he was one of the very early illustrators. If you look in the 1850s, 1860s, most of these illustrations were sort of stick-like. They weren't very good medical illustrations. But he gave tone, he gave light, he gave highlights. He gave wetness to tissues. And here's Johns Hopkins, just after it opened up. Doesn't look much different, the main building today. And here's Max in his first studio. He began his work with Howard Kelly, the OBGYN physician, and basically started to work with the W.B. Saunders Company on his book on operative gynecology. And while he was working with Kelly, he, began, he befriended Tom Cullen, who became his lifelong friend, who was another physician. At the same time, he became close to Harvey Cushing, who was the progenitor of neurosurgery, the founder of American neurosurgery. And at that time, Dr. Cushing was a resident under Dr. Halstead. I had the fortune of studying Bradle's original operating uh, room sketches, and these are from his original operating room sketches. These are the first impressions that he had of operations. He watched uh, operations and basically made notes. And as you can see, he was still, even in 1899, was still using terms like blaulich rot, red, blood red, blue red. He was still using some of the German terms, and you can see it's drawn on Johns Hopkins stationery. These are his early sketches. This operation was done on 1899 on October 31st. This is a cholecystectomy. Here's a parotid tumor from an operation done November 16th, 1900, and he's still talking about more yellow, add more yellow, mehr Gettlich. 
Now this is an operation that, uh, very interesting, that was done from one of Harvey Cushing's operations. Remember I told you he's the father of neurosurgery, now Harvey Cushing's doing general surgery during his residency, and if you can see this pin that's lodged in the cecum causing appendicitis or an abscess, and basically this is an original drawing. And I had the opportunity to go through the entire archives and to photograph most of these different operations. And you'll see how this is transformed in these beautiful drawings that he did. Actually, Cushing became the mainstay of Dr. Halstead's service, in fact, did many of Dr. Halstead's operations, sort of ghost surgery, uh, and so Cushing was at many of these operations that were Dr. Halstead's. This is gone. Here's an operation for breast carcinoma. Now, you can see in those days, people would present with very much inflammatory carcinoma. That's why the radical mastectomy came. You know, now we do little lumpectomies and radiation. In those days, we didn't see cancer like that. We saw patients who had skin erosion and terrible fungating carcinomas of the breast. And that's why the radical mastectomy was developed, so that you would not have local recurrence inside in the skin. And this is again from his sketchbook in the operating room. He even, this is an, an animal experiment, uh, and Dr. Howe, who was the chairman of physiology, asked him to do some drawings to show this restraint of this, of this, uh, this, this uh, primate hand. Now this is very interesting, because uh, this is Max's hand. As you know, as you may know, many artists of that era, Vesalius and others, would include themselves in the frontispiece. Rialdo Colombo's uh, book on, uh, on uh, anatomy and uh, shows a little picture of him from the 1500s. Well, this is Max Bradle. Now, on March 20th, 1899, he had been handling and drawing organs from an infected pelvis. Remember, in those days, he didn't wear gloves. The next morning, he had severe streptococcal infection of the right hand and arm. So Joseph Bloodgood and Harvey Cushing operated on him and drained the primary site at the epitrochlear area of an abscess. The first sketches here of his own hand was basically shown, shown uh, where the red is the site near the, uh, the elbow which they drained it. Here we see his sketches of the progression of his problem thereafter. The ap April 18th sketch that you see here shows loss of tactile sensation in the April 20, uh, the other sketch, the one at the top, shows absent heat sensation in the ulnar distribution. So he's describing his own disease. Now, of course, he's an illustrator, so he's very, he's very worried about this because it would be like a surgeon who would lose some fingers. He had three more operations by Dr. Halstead, and the last one relieved the painful ulnar entrapment, and luckily he made a full recovery. After seven, months of, uh, after seven months of anesthesia in his arm, he made an absolute complete recovery. He made a total of 20 drawings of tracings of patients with neural regeneration and reestablishment of normal sensation uh, in his, both his piano and his drawing hand. He was a great pianist. Remember his dad wanted him to be a pianist, or his music teacher did. So these are actual photographs that I made of the original material. This is not out of a book. This is the original stuff. So let me tell you how he did his drawings. I showed you the operating room sketch. He did it in soft carbon pencil or sometimes in color. Then he transferred that image. It was soft carbon. He transferred it onto a piece of paper and rubbed it. So what do you have now? Negative. Then he transferred that back onto the stipple board, which made another positive, and then did the pen and ink sketch on stipple board, which was basically a, uh, a very thin clay board. And that's when he did the carbon dust drawing or the pen and ink. This is an example. Here's an instrument. This is from his sketchbook. That's a positive. Flip it over, rub it, now you have a negative. Here's a patient with carcinoma of the breast, and he wanted to make this drawing. This is the photograph of the actual patient. Fortunately, I was able to find the, the photograph as well as the, um, the, the sketches. 
You can see this is a radical mastectomy. And the silver stuff, they used to put silver foil because it decreased, uh, it was antimicrobial. It decreased infection. Remember, no antibiotics. First antibiotics were developed in 1939 by Prontosil, which was a sulfonamide. Later, penicillin was developed by Alexander Fleming in chain and fluorine. And so here's the operating room sketch he made. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? Pretty close to the lady. So now he flipped this over, rubbed it. And you get a verso, a negative image. Okay? Then it goes back onto the stipple board, rubbed, and gives him the little faint impression that he can do the final illustration. This is a carbon dust illustration. But look at the tones. Look at the highlights. There's no loss in the middle tones. You can see the lights. You can see the darks. This is what Ansel Adams aspired to do in his photography, and this is what I tried to do in my photography, is to get the entire range of tones without losing any detail. This is the kind of illustration that made him so famous. This was published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, 1913. And here again is a photograph after the skin graft was healed. It looks like a gross operation, but when you have a fungating cancer growing in your chest wall, it was really a saving operation because the Europeans were having 25 to 50 percent local recurrence from breast carcinoma. He only had less than 5 percent local recurrence. They weren't trying to save your life long term because you had positive nodes, but they were just trying to make you uh, uh, have a better lifestyle and not have a local recurrence. This is his pen and ink technique. And what he would do, this is clay stipple board. It's a very, very fine layer of clay. So now he's got his impression made onto the stipple board. And what he does, he paints. How do you get the little white lines that are so thin? Well, as you can see, did you get that work? As you can see, what he does is basically paint black and then take a very fine knife, a very fine scalpel, and make these feathered lines here to give you the white highlights. He didn't paint the white highlights. He basically scratched back with the carbon back to the board so that the white showed through. So you can make these tiny fine lines and give this idea of a reflection or wetness to tissue. So he worked in two media. One was pen and ink. The other was carbon dust that we've shown you earlier. Here's another example. This is a GYN operation. And as you can see, here's his operating room sketch. Here's the flip over negative. And you can see the verso. If, if you look at the words, you can see they're just like a negative. They're the opposite. Ending up with a pen and ink drawing like this. This was miraculous for the time because it was in all these books at Halstead and, and Cushing and Cullen and all these guys were publishing. And I think this is what helped make them famous because it would, it would really show you how to do an operation rather than just in words. It also had depth, three-dimensionality to it. It had realism. Probably the hardest thing to draw, I think, is hands. How do you draw hands? So, especially with gloves on. Now remember, this was later. This is 1926. Where did the gloves come from? Remember, they didn't have gloves before. I'll tell you the story about Halstead and the gloves. William Stewart Halstead was professor of surgery, and his nurse, Caroline Hampton, was having trouble with dermatitis because was putting his, her hands in mercuric chloride to basically sterilize her hands, and she was getting a chafing. So he kind of liked her, and so when he was in New York, he went to the Goodyear Rubber Company and bought some gl little gloves with gauntlets. And so Caroline Hampton was uh, the first to wear gloves. And I think it was Bloodgood, one of his residents, was the first to wear gloves. And I always said this is the first time that, uh, and then it was documented that this really helped with sterility. And I said this is the first time a love affair was documented in a medical journal. <laughs> but this is really how, how gloves came into existence. Uh, I always tell the residents, you need to know where the instruments came from. You need to know where all the technique, you know, where was the first mask, my miculates. You need to know the origins. Here, here's Howard Atwood Kelly. The man standing up there is William Stewart Halstead. 
The man sitting on your left is William Henry Welch. And you may have heard of William Osler. So William Osler is sitting there in the middle with the, uh, with the pen in hand. This is a painting by John Singer Sargent. It's called The Big Four. It hangs at Hopkins in the Welch Library. It's been resuscitated. They said they didn't, Halstead was a weird guy, and they didn't really like him too much, uh, or at least Sargent didn't. So they said they painted Halstead in the back that he would fade out in 100 years. <laughs> well, you know, at the 100th year anniversary, before that, they looked up and Halstead was almost gone. And I don't know if that's true, but he was almost gone. So they got someone to restore the painting and, and brought all, and resuscitated and gave a Lazarus uh, therapy to, uh, to William Stewart Halstead. These men were the ones that started Johns Hopkins and the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. This is from Kelly's book, and he wrote an entire book on the appendix. Can you imagine? He wrote another one on the umbilicus. Can you imagine you know, a whole book dedicated to the umbilicus? And, but it talks about the embryology, but this is the kind of stuff that Max Bradle did. And, uh, and here's a picture of the cecum and the development of the cecum. Here's the embryonic, or the newborn, and how it develops. These are smart people. You know, we always think we're credited with being the smartest people. Well, these people are very smart. I mean, with, you know, Ernest Henry Starling determined the Starling effect with, with the heart, you know, with, a, with an animal experiment, with a, you know, a liquid manometer, and with a chymograph, and he's doing the same things that we're doing in the operating room with echocardiography and pressure measurements. So here's a description of an appendectomy, one of the early appendectomies. Halstead developed these fine instruments called Halstead clamps because before the clamps were bulky and they weren't very good for clamping arteries, but these had fine tips, very delicate fine tips. And here again, showing the appendectomy. And just look at the detail. It really is graphic. You take a student or a resident and you try to show them this. I mean, obviously today we don't, uh, this was, I don't, can't tell you which year, but he's not wearing gloves. So this is before the days of gloves. And of course we do most of this laparoscopically now, but when I was a resident, this is exactly what we did to do an appendectomy. August Horn was one of his colleagues, came from Leipzig, died early. And basically, uh, this is a mem in memoriam to August Horn, and basically this is one of August Horn's drawings. So you can see the Leipzig school influence not only just in Bradle, but in, in others who trained there. This is from Bradle's daughter, Ruth Huntington Bradle. And again, very much the Leipzig School showing the different layers of the appendix. Can you believe this? That an appendix looks like this. I've never seen one so handsome. This is from Kelly's Operative Gynecology. And this is from Kelly's book talking about how to uh, divide uh, part of the kidney if you have a tumor in the kidney using this wire technique. This is the last photograph of William Stewart Halstead. It's the Stockdale photograph done in 1920. William Stewart Halstead had a place at High Hampton in Western Carolina, Western North Carolina. Uh, he would retreat there for the summer months. Can you imagine me retreating from my surgical schedule just to, for three months to quote, think and write? Uh, he was addicted to cocaine. What happened with this was he was doing nerve blocks in New York City before he came to Hopkins and basically got addicted to cocaine where they were injecting nerve blocks. And then probably transitioned to morphine. He was probably on low doses of morphine all of his life. In fact, uh, in the western part of Carolina, they found his prescription. So, you know, he had, he had some flaws. He sent his clothes, his shirts, to Paris to be laundered. That was a little bit unusual, you know, and yet Baltimore had good laundry. But he was an eccentric. But he was the founder of the residency system in the United States. He was also really the founder of, of modern surgery and developed these operations. He would think about these operations, take them to the laboratory, develop the operation, then take it back to the operating room to effect a cure for the patient. In other words, he did some of the earliest clinical trials without the FDA, <laughs> which he probably was more successful than we are sometimes. This is from my collection, and I have most of the Halstead original publications. You can see I did not steal these from Johns Hopkins Medical Library. These were 
ones that I bought from others who I guess don't know who uh, probably. Uh, see, when they cleaned out the Welch Library, there were a lot of duplicates. And the librarians at that time, they didn't, they said, we got two copies. Okay, let's sell this one. Well, sometimes I have Howard Kelly's copy of the appendix. You know, they, gave, they sold the wrong copy. But you can see this is a discussion using a biliary, uh, examining the biliary tree for stones, and how do you keep the, it from growing back and stricturing down? Well, you put these little silver hammers he made, Halstead did, and you leave the little silver hammer outside the, uh, outside the abdomen. You put sutures in there, and after it's healed, then you pop these, one of these little hammers out, and the fistula uh, closes so it doesn't get narrowed, it doesn't stricture. This is an article, uh, the first transplants of parathyroid. He was the one that determined that the, um, that the uh, blood supply to the parathyroid comes from the inferior thyroid artery, and basically started to do parathyroid transplants. Moved later in 1976 when Sam Wells did the first uh, parathyroid transplants at Duke, showing that you could transplant a parathyroid gland. So again, he worked not only in the experimental laboratory, but with patients. Another one from Halstead, and this is the article, again these are all Bradle drawings, that talks about the first gloves and silver foil for sterilizing wounds. And you can see this meticulous handling of technique. Halstead's basic tenets were you don't close tissues under tension. You make sure there's meticulous hemostasis and no bleeding. You don't leave a dead space. You either put a drain in there or close the dead space. And this is a way so you get good healing. He was very meticulous. Before, surgeons were very rough. If you look at some of the work, some of the, uh, the photographs from uh, the paintings in Philadelphia about that time in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s by Aiken, basically you see very rough handling of tissues. But this was very, very delicate tissue. And what he got? Excellent results with good healing and very low infection rates. Infections come from bugs, from contamination, but they also come from having a media there to make these bacteria grow, such as in a dead space where there is some tissue fluids and they just love it. So if you take care of that, make sure there's good blood supply but not bleeding, then you have better healing, things we do today. This is one of his greatest books, 1917, The Story of Gorder, all done by Bradle. And you can see these beautiful drawings, the thyroid, the parathyroids, great detail, and the surgical technique. And here again, we're using gloves, it's, it's later. Again, this is from a lot of my stuff that I have at the house. I've got a full run of the Johns Hopkins Wollaston from that time. And those fine tip clamps, clamping arteries to get meticulous hemostasis. Again, careful closing of the skin. We do this now through an incision about like this, but still, this was monumental for the day. And here's Max Bradle, 1917, and look what's on his wall in his studio. Those are, the pair, those are the thyroid ones I just showed you from the book. Those are the original illustrations. And of course, I've had a chance to look at all these at, at, at Hopkins. This is another interesting one. You see this illustration, and you can't really see the man in that illustration. But boy, look at Max. They look a lot alike, don't they? So Max drew himself into this, uh, into this drawing where Max, basically this is a thrombosis of, arm, uh, of, of vessels in the arm and neck, but he drew himself into this. Gosh, here's Max again. <laughs> They're drawing blood cultures from this guy's arm to, to see you know, if they had septic. And actually Max had, Max had gotten sick and had blood cultures drawn. This was probably during the time that he had the problem with his hand and he just thought he would uh, you know, uh, memorialize this through his uh, own illustrations. Wow, who's this? This is Howard Atwood Kelly. He's looking up, uh, and that's Max's rear end, <laughs> believe it or not. So Bradle actually posed for this and got the whole thing. See the light bulb up there? And this is Howard Kelly doing a proctoscopic examination and Max was the model for this. So it's interesting how sometimes you, and I wouldn't get in this position and have Walter Poise draw a cartoon to me like this, I'll tell you that. 
Here's Harvey Williams Cushing, a very interesting man, a bit eccentric, a very demanding human being of his residence and of himself. He was not only a fantastic surgeon and developed really neurosurgery, but he was a fantastic book collector. His library eventually went to Yale and is the, was the seed for the Yale History of Medicine Library. Uh, a very erudite man. And you can see here, this is some stuff that Max had done for him, looking at pituitary. He's the first to do pituitary hypophysectomies. And you can see you would go up under the nose and basically go into the cella tercica, which is the Turk saddle, the bone in the middle of the head, and would remove these, uh, these uh, cella tumors. And I think this is, a fa this is the largest illustration in the collection. And I just shot a picture of the board. Because it's interesting, if you look very carefully, it's pieced together. Okay? <laughs> in other words, they, you know, he said, this, this isn't working. So he pieced it together. <laughs> okay? Is that going to pass muster? No, it wouldn't pass muster. But I'll tell you, when the final, final drawing was done, it passed muster. And this is a pen and ink drawing. So you go back from here, his early sketches, to here. Now, isn't it interesting? If I had a headlight like that, I mean, basically, it was a light bulb screwed into his head there, you know. And look at the mask. Rather than having a mask, it was just basically a piece of gauze tied around his head. There were many disciples of Max Bradle. And this is his School of Art as Applied to Medicine, 1917. This school is very much like it is, to, is today, except they're not sitting in one big gallery, but there are many students in different areas, and some working on computers, some working on pen and ink, some doing modeling. The thing about it, we have much more media today. And here's Cushing. And Cushing always, he was an, an excellent artist. Well, where did he learn it? Max taught him how to draw. And so basically after every case, he would go in and smoke his cigarette, have his coffee pot, a silver tea set, and have his tea or coffee, and he would draw the brain tumor himself. So every one of his operations, he actually drew himself. And here's one he drew of his brother Ned. Ned, was, I thought this was Osler for a long time, but it's not. It's his brother Ned, and who I guess he really didn't open Ned's head but basically use him as a model, and this is one of Cushing's drawings. Pretty good for a surgeon, I would think. Now, this is an interesting book. This is the birthday book, and I can't remember which year. This is maybe 1939. Uh, they put this book together for Max Bradle of all of his students, and this is at, at Hopkins, and I brought, laid this out on a nice piece of velvet and photographed it. But it's interesting. Here you have Mildred Cotting in the picture, Dorcas Hager, who drew for, uh, uh, blocking, Francis Woodall, who married Dr. Woodall, who was a resident, and Dr. Woodall was the first professor of neurosurgery at Duke, Barnes Woodall. And so basically, um, and, and I know he, uh, her daughter, Elizabeth Bradle, which is Max Bradle's daughter. Here's James Didish, and, and he didn't draw medical things per se, but he worked in embryology. And here he is in 1912, one of the students. His brother, William Didish, and he did all this early work in urology and illustrated everything for Hugh Hampton Young, who was the progenitor of urology in this country. And here, this is from Bertrand Bernheim's uh, showing the first venous graph for a popliteal aneurysm. This is all from the birthday book. And here's Dorcas Paget, and I slipped the mind, you know, when you get older, you can't remember the name. Walter Dandy, and basically, she was the one that did all these drawings. Again, from the very beginning of uh, neurosurgery, and helped to illustrate these books. Etta Piotti. Etta Piotti moved to Boston and worked with Robert Gross. Robert Gross was the first person to ligate a patent ductus arteriosus, and, and later on, he started to try to operate in the heart without the heart-lung machine. There was no heart-lung machine at this time. And so what he did, he sew a well, this rubber well, onto the atrium, let the blood come up in this, because it's, remember, it's, it's venous blood, so it's going to have a certain level, 
and he worked blindly down through this blood to sow an atrial septal defect. And this was done by Eta Piotti, who was one of Bradle's students. So you see, it goes on and on. Millie Cotting, who we've already talked about, was with Cushing. She became the artist for Dwight Harkin, who did some of the first aortic and mitral valve surgery. And these are some of her illustrations. Again, an early mitral valve replacement. And of course, Elon Clark, who came to Duke from, uh, from Bradle's program. And this is Elon Clark, and I knew Elon Clark uh, in 1940, starting the program. And then, of course, my friend Leon Schlossberg, who was, was one of the last trainees and just passed away last year. And basically, he did all the early work for Dr. Blaylock, the Blaylock Towsing operation, the blue baby, baby operation. Here's the first blue baby operation, where you take the subclavian artery and sew it to the right pulmonary artery to establish more blood supply to the heart when you have stenosis of the outflow tract so you don't get enough blood to, to, the, um, to the lungs and therefore you end up with a blue baby. And this was the first palliative operation done in 1946. Here is a large, a large uh, ductus arteriosus. And this was Leon many, many years later when I knew him. And this is some of the work he did for me when I was at Duke. Dr. Sabison always liked the Hopkins illustrators, so he would bring a lot of the Hopkins illustrators down to work with us in doing different uh, sketches and things for our papers. So one thing in those days, there was a little bit of money in the system, so we could channel it toward medical illustration and all kinds of academic things. I got to know Renice Crosby. She was one of the, she was really the first curator of all of the Bradle, uh, all the Bradle collection in Hopkins. She was quite nice to me, wrote many years ago. You know, we wrote back and forth and corresponded even when I was a resident. And then, of course, uh, she, uh, um, she passed on, but she was the one that cataloged all of this Bradle material and kept it, didn't send it to the Chesney Archives. The Chesney Archives is pretty white glove. You know, hard to get things out, hard to see stuff. She insisted that this Bradle collection stayed in the School of Art as Applied to Medicine so that the students could see it. And of course, they would get these illustrations out for them to see the original work. He also did uh, non-medical illustration. This is Lake Amick up in Ontario, where he had a little place and he, he loved to spend time there. You can see Max getting porco porcupine spindles out of his shoe. He liked to make cheese. He made beer during Prohibition. He had the Saturday Night Club with H.L. Mencken. They were good friends, the, the, uh, the great newspaper man. And they would sing and drink beer and eat cheese and smoke cigars and have a great, it was on, they call it called the, the, the Friday Night Club. And you can see Max liked to fish. This is one of his color drawings. I thought this was very interesting. This is at Hopkins, one of the, these bracket fungi that are on trees and he would take those and would illustrate on these, and he still have those up there. Now, what year was that? That was 1928. Now, he also liked to do these, uh, these announcements to these different dinners, when people would retire or something like this. And this is a dinner to honor Dr. Halstead. And here's the sketch. And you can see he had all kinds of different, you know, he would have, in the folders there, he'd have four or five different ways you could do it which would turn out like this. <laughs> and so basically, uh, everybody who left Hopkins to become a professor, he would give them a great uh, invitation to, this, to these dinners. He also did the St. John's Hopkins. This is uh, Osler chasing away all the bacteria, as you can see here at the bottom. And look at Tom Cullen, his great friend. He couldn't decide if Tom needed a bow, a bow tie or a regular tie, so he painted both. Now, these, were, these haven't been published, you know, and I can't remember which one he used for the invitation when Tom left. Here's Dr. Blaylock, and he did this little caricature when Dr. Blaylock came back to Hopkins. The old professor, Hall said, was dead. They'd had about 15 years that not much had happened in Hopkins, and then Blaylock comes back. You see the rising sun there, the little kids carrying his books, and everybody welcoming Dr. Blaylock and said, the old professor has returned. Now here's some letters that I copied 
uh, there, and this talks about letters from Dr. Blaylock as he's coming back, and Max Bradle, you know, he was getting older then. He died in 1941. Blaylock came in 1941, and he was obviously vying to make sure he had a job when Dr. Blaylock, and so he wrote, Dr. Blaylock said, you know, it's great to meet you uh, and to be present at dinner given in your honor. In other words, I'm available to do medical illustrations for you. Here's one of his last drawings, and look at the complexity of this. This is the inner ear, the tympanic membrane, the incus, the malleus, you know, the, the inner ear of the ear, the, the facial nerve, the, the, uh, the cochlear nerve, but look at the detail. This is one of his last drawings in 1941. Here is the George Corner drawing of Max just before he died. So this man was a giant among giants. He was friends of surgeons. I think he helped surgeons become famous because they developed the operations, but he was the one that could show it to the masses. He developed a school of art. He befriended a man by the name of Walters who funded the school of art at Hopkins, and basically it exists today. We showed you some of his early students, but they're still students. In fact, we've had several. One of our uh, illustrators here came from that same school, and it continues. There were four or five schools that came out of this, schools of medical illustration. But this is really, I think, a very important component to, uh, to what we do today, is medical illustration, being able to show what we do to others. And these are the credits. Max Bradle's book that Renice Crosby wrote. Gary Lees was quite helpful to me. He's the director. Uh, I spent three or four days up there going through. I was giving the Blaylock lecture at Hopkins, and so I said, you've got to give me a couple extra days over there in the books. And uh, the Alan Chesney archives where I got some things, and of course the American Neurosurgical Society, uh, uh, we, I got that 2000 brain tumor. I'd be glad to answer questions. I think I've stayed on my time at 45 minutes and, uh, and answer any questions about anything. Uh, Dr. Chitwood, are you familiar with Netter and the Netter drawings, and are they part of the school of uh, yeah, Netter was an interesting guy. In fact, I knew him, and I have a, a lot of his work and stuff that was signed by him because my dad gave me these things in the 50s, you know, the, the Seba Symposia and all the Netter things, and so I sent them to Netter and corresponded with him for a while. I'm very familiar with his work. He's a great illustrator. He's self-trained, totally self-trained. And basically, he was an MD and uh, did that entire series of books by the, Ciba, by the Ciba company, which still is pretty modern today. It gives you great anatomy of the heart and is another great, I think he's another great illustrator. And really one of the first illustrators to do things in color, you know, in the early 50s. Does he have any connection to, to Max Bradle? No, not at all. He was a New Yorker and was totally self-trained. And it's interesting, after he died, they tried, they had, you know, they continued with the Seba Symposia, but they were a little different after Netter. Yeah, I correspond, you know, I, I had a tendency, in the old days, when a young man writes an old man, they'll usually write you back. <laughs> okay? You know, when a young man writes a young man, they won't write you back. <laughs> you know, when an old man writes an old man, they won't write you back. But the idea is, like, I corresponded with uh, a whole bunch of people. Helen Towsing, the first woman pediatric cardiologist when I was a resident, you know, wanderlust. You know, you want to learn as much as you can. Other questions? Walter. Well, that was just superb, and it's exactly what we expect of you. Uh, you have accumulated a wonderful library, and I congratulate you. It's just superb. Yeah, you know, when you're a resident, my wife said, it's not the big books you buy, it's those little ones, those little old ones. And I had a running tab with Terry Cavanaugh, who ran Old Galen's book and was also one of the librarians at, uh, at Duke. I always had a running tab when I was a resident. I remember one day I went down there and said, Terry, I want to see the Vesalius, I want to see the Harvey. I got 20 minutes. He said, oh, Randy. Your sensory input could not take both in one day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the idea was, you know, come have tea and look at the Vesalius and basically, um, uh, you know, enjoy the book and then maybe I'll let you look at another one, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm going bam, 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 I want the history of medicine, cram it in me, get it, you know, get it, get it to me. 
and he's saying you, you have to absorb it, you know, so. Uh, and, uh, this guy has inoculated me for everything. And uh, that's why you're here. <laughs> Dodd, Dod, when I go to Africa, you know, he, he looks up and he says, oh, there's some bad bugs in that country. You know, uh, you better have a shot of this. Go ahead. Excellent leg, uh, talk, really, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, when you understand the history of medicine, that's when you understand really uh, what kind of a sacred profession it is, honestly. And uh, a lot of the cynicism of medicine in uh, young uh, doctors I see probably is because of the, uh, the lack of understanding of uh, how, how rich our profession is, honestly. So uh, what is your uh, take on uh, history of medicine being part of uh, medical education? The modern medicine? doctor. You know, this, is, this is a Don't very important started. thing. And because we, I, mean, I have never heard about Rod, for example. Well, it's interesting. I think. I enjoyed I, it. Uh, th thanks, Dan. I, I, I think the young, uh, the younger doctors, they're either not aware, or they don't care as much about the history, because there's so much technology, there's so much new stuff to learn. But every time I write a paper, every time I think about something, I go back to the origin. I go back and find out about the first operation that was ever done. And you realize there's some very smart people that had the same idea, they just didn't have the technology to execute that idea at that time. For example, Alexander Fleming, 1928, discovered penicillin. How did he discover penicillin? Because of St. Mary's Hospital in London. And basically, he went out of town, he left his auger plates sitting there, he had some staphylococcus that he was growing, and he forgot and left the tops off and the windows open. And he comes back in, and he sees there's a big area that there's no bacteria. And he says, this is unusual. So he grows his stuff, it's penicillium notatum, which is basically penicillin. And so he discovered penicillin. He didn't get the Nobel Prize until 1930-something. Because it was Chain and Flory at Oxford that were able to purify penicillin. And so what I'm saying is, even though he had a great idea, and knew what was, was to happen. If we could make this stuff, it would work really good. But it wasn't until the technology came along. But the idea, everything is built on the shoulders of giants. There's a very nice book actually about this story. I'm sure you might have, you might have read it, Dr. Flory's uh, yes. uh, quote. That's mm -hmm. exactly what it discusses, a very interesting book about and so they got so, he so they sort of picked up Alexander Fleming later on and gave him the Nobel Prize with Chain yeah, of Flory. three of them. They but, shared, three of them shared the same Nobel Prize, uh, yeah. Flory, Cheng, and uh, Alexander Fleming for the same year. Dr. Sabison, who was my mentor, worked with Chain. Chain was still around when he was uh, in the 50s uh, at, at Oxford. Um, when, I was in, when my dad was in medical school at UVA in 1941, he had one bottle of penicillin, a little, little vial like that. And they could take it out, take a hundred units and give it to somebody and it would now, now the bugs eat penicillin, you know, for lunch. They would collect the urine because there was no probenicid because you'd lose it in the urine and they would recrystallize the urine and get the penicillin back. And so one of the residents dropped the bottle. I wonder what happened to him. He was probably decapitated. <laughs> Can you imagine the only <laughs> vial of penicillin in the University of Virginia Hospital? But 1941, and so, you know, I told you Ponticill's 1939, Bodice, uh, Immediately before penicillin. That's, that's right. Barsha Anilin und Sodafabrik. It's a sulfonamide. And so basically, that, so antibiotics didn't come in until, I mean, there was nothing for. Remember, to treat TB, you'd get on the porch and get some fresh air in the 20s. You look at Saranac uh, in New York, the great sanatorium where Robert Louis Stevenson was there. And basically, I have an album that my dad found somewhere of the photographs of people sitting out there. You know, they were fairly wealthy people. They're sitting out there. Uh, you know, in there with the snow out there on the porch, breathing air, trying to get rid of their tuberculosis. Or you would collapse the lungs so that there wouldn't be a space in there and have collapse therapy before antibiotics. Then antibiotics came out and basically TB went away as we knew it then. Other questions? Yes, sir. Great presentation, Dr. Chitwood. Um, we talk about the beautiful history of uh, illustration. As a medical student and also an artist, I would love to keep uh, my art going. What do you think the future is of medical illustration with all this technology? Well, it's changing. 
it's changing. I'm doing a book on robotic surgery, and I'm having Becky Dodson, who worked with Walter and me here many years ago, now lives in Columbus, Ohio, and she's probably the foremost pen and ink artist in the United States. I want to I want to do a classical book on modern technology, but so many books are being done now with with um, you know computer graphics, so you have to learn that if you're going to do that. You know, uh, we used to have a plastic surgeon here by the name of Janice Lolikos. And Janice had trained before she went to medical school at the Hopkins School of Art. And basically then Janice went to medical school, became a fine plastic surgeon. And, you know, of course that's the ultimate. You know, having both the right brain, the left brain, stuff like this. But I think that, you know, you, you need to have, uh, I think you do need training if you want to pursue the art, you know, as, as being important. Uh, and basically, you know, you got to know some computer graphics. Unfortunately, I, you know, I, I like I like stuff that's really done with your hands. But you know, maybe I'm old school because <laughs> it's very expensive. The old school stuff, I'll tell you that. Absolutely. You know, when you're paying three hundred dollars a plate, you know, an illustration, and you have you know a couple hundred illustrations in a book, you know, you got to raise some money you know, to get that book done. Yes, I, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank Absolutely. You. Uh, history of medicine is exciting and, and you really brought it to life. I think that's very difficult to do. I can see how you have your own hospital because you My really- My own hospital? Well, you well know, I'm at heart surgery. Why did you think I built that thing so I, so I could reside I, I in think it so. Sunday, huh? <laughs> but I enjoyed your comments a lot because I think the, the history of medicine is just so alive to me and I, but I've never heard a, uh, a presentation to be so lively. Well, you know, you have to make it live, especially for the medical students. If you go down there and, and, and pimp them and say, you know, do you know who Sir William Osler is? Well, they should know about, you know, from the courses here at the Brody School of Medicine, they should already know who Osler is. And I'll say, uh, what, what I used to ask my kids when the residents were there, I'd say, tell them the master word. And the kids, when they were little, they'd go, W-O-R-K, work, work, work. Okay, that's the kids. Well, Osler used to say, you know, there's a small word, although it looms large in meaning, it's the touchstone that transmutes all base metals into gold. It's the true philosopher's stone. With his word in your heart, all is possible. Without it, all is vanity and vexation. The stupid among the stupid uh, among you will make bright the bright student brilliant, and the brilliant student steady. And of course, the Yale students, when he did this thing, said, "But Sir William, what is the master word? W O R K. In other words, you can overcome a whole lot by hard work." So when we get to the 80-hour work week <laughs> and we get into reduced hours, don't get me started because I spent 10 years every other night in the hospital to do. You know, my wife got five years of vacation essentially, you know. And so basically, but when you spend that kind of time, oh sure it was stressful, stressful on the family, the whole thing. Oh, it was just horrible for us. We were tired all the time. It's better to have a tired doctor than no doctor. And so, but what I happened, you got tremendous experience. You lived it. You absolutely lived it. So now you take a six year residency and you have an 80 hour work week, you have degraded that education by about 50%. So now your surgeon has 50% of the experience. I couldn't have started a heart program here had I not had the kind of experience. When Walter hired me, you know, I came down here and I was foolish enough to think I could start a heart program. And Walter convinced me. He said, well, Randy, I think you can probably do this, you know. And so, come down to a little tobacco town and start a heart surgery program. I went to the chief and said, what do you think? He says, you know, I'm from Kinson. He said, well, they're nice people there. He did not want me to go to St. Louis. He wanted to stay at Duke or do something else. So, you know, I came here. You can't do that anymore, right out of your residency. You can't do it. You don't have the administrative skills. You don't have the surgical skills. And in those times, we had tremendous drive. And you don't have the drive. You know, now everybody wants to go to the gym. You know, they want to go home and spend quality time. Well, you know, how do you become at the top of your game? Somebody's got to sacrifice. You've got to sacrifice. You know, your family's got to sacrifice if you want to be the best. Don't get me started because basically, I said, you know, somebody else said, well, you know, I want to be, have a balanced life like my dad one time. He says, son, you're not studying enough. And I said, well, I want to be well-rounded. He says, well, you're just going to roll through life and not collect any moss, you know? And the idea is, is, it comes from hard work. I mean, it really does. You don't have to be that brilliant to do what I'm doing. You just got to be able to, you know, do it, execute, 
make mid-course corrections like Malcolm Gladwell said you got to spend 10,000 hours to do it. Now I don't think if 10,000 hours playing the violin that would be very good but the point is it's, it's repetitive work and and then making self-corrections and mid-course corrections. So I tell young medical students it's good. I, I teach with medical students and residents. I'll say, do you know what this instrument is? And they'll say, no, I don't know. They say, well, you know, who designed it? I said, don't know, have no idea. And I said, well, there was a guy by the name of Cameron Haight. And he worked at the University of Michigan. There was a guy named Alexander. And he developed this device so that you could actually help to open the chest because he was having trouble opening this segment of this rib and he would dissect this rib. And that's how that came about. You know, and, and, and you know, Walter and I enjoy, you know, learning the history of medicine and stuff like this and knowing where every instrument came from, where every operation came from. And then I say, take that knowledge. Take the knowledge you had in medical school. Now innovate and come up with something totally different that's the future. And they say the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so, you know, it's not just the past, the present, but you've got to be able to be, if you want to be a player, to be able to project into the future and say, you know, I get a lot of pushback, I'm getting buildings and stuff, he said, well, there he goes again, getting another building, you know. I mean, I get, I gotten all kinds of pushback, okay. You know, there he is, who does he think he is, you know, and I hear that stuff. And usually as the applause meter goes down, I figured my success meter is going up. You know, it's like the first time I had a paper rejected, I said, this is going to be a very famous paper, you know, but it's going to have to have some work. So I think that, uh, you know, building things and innovating and stuff like this comes to knowledge, tenacity, you know, it's, it's, it's basically what's inside you. And I tell the young students, I say, where I'm going, going for now are the undergraduates. I bring the Park Scholars down from NC State, they're engineers. Uh, we've got the Brody Scholars, I take two, I take four in the summer, and basically give them a project, and I talk to them just like adults. I say, okay, I want you to look at the pressure flow relationships here. Now, what are you, an engineer, electrical engineer? Okay, let's, let's talk about in terms of resistors, capacitance, you know, batteries, Ohm's law and stuff like this. Well, they get it and they get turned on. So I think those are the guys that I really work on to turn on. If somebody's already gone through medical school and the residency, it's hard to change the pathway. But if you can turn them on to the cardiovascular system very early in college, then, then you have somebody and they'll listen. Boy, they'll be, they'll be like little puppy dogs, you know, around. I put a white coat on them and I take them in there, and show them a patient, we listen to murmurs together, and they say, well, who are these guys? I said, I don't know, I got them up over, over at the, uh, you know, I found them over in the parking lot, and, and then I tell them that they're the future doctors. <laughs> it's cool stuff. All right, folks, it's time to go eat, I guess. <laughs>